we talked about the um, the content of the of my talk, and uh, kind of uh, f agreed with the organizers that I would kind of stream it a little bit in a different direction, and essentially talk a little about a bit about Europe and what's happening with European tech. Uh, as our MC mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders of TechU. TechU is basically so. How many people have ever heard of TechU? Okay, great, fantastic, thank you. Uh, for those who don't know, it's an online publication based essentially covering technology companies and technology trends throughout Europe. We try to cover them in more detail, and more long form than the usual short blog posts on most, most tech publications. And we try to go all over Europe. We try to find interesting companies, interesting events, and things going on throughout Europe. So a few years ago, I wrote a little piece about the Bulgarian startup ecosystem. Uh, a few months ago, I was in Tallinn in Estonia. And I'm, basic, I'm originally from Zagreb, Croatia, where I'm based. Uh, and it's great to be uh, back in uh, Sofia. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, congratulate for a very interesting conference, and also thank them for this wonderful weather, lovely weather that we're having uh, for the conference itself. So, who knows what happened on January 9th, 2001 in technology? Okay, I won't, uh, won't I'll go to the, skip to the answer immediately. Um, iTunes was launched. So iTunes, as I'm sure all of you know, was a breakthrough event for digital music. Until then, there was piracy, there was Napster, but there wasn't really a way to enjoy digital music that was legally licensed and where you could buy song by song instead of just having to buy the whole crappy album because that one hit. So it was a really revolution in the way we enjoyed and, and music and in our uh, digital entertainment. Um, now, if you go back and think about iTunes, those of you that were already you know, growing up at the time, there was a device that went with it. It was called iPod. So today, we remember iPods as something our grandparents used a long, long time ago. So who listens to music on their iPod today? Okay, still a few veterans out there. Good to see. Most of us, however, use one of these. So how many people use Spotify? Okay, Deezer. Okay, Last.fm, bit older generation, SoundCloud. So, you know, we used to download music to our devices. We don't, mostly we don't do that anymore, or at least very little. Now we use streaming. So streaming is the way most people consume digital music today. And if you look at the reports, they say that finally artists and uh, composers are getting more and more money directly from their, from their uh, music being played on the streaming services. So aside from all of these being streaming music services, what else do all of these companies have in common? That's right, they're European companies. So when, when Apple came up with iTunes and iPod, essentially Americans took over digital music, and now we Europeans took it back. Thank you to Daniel Ek and the other great founders of these companies. So if you look at digital music today, the space is owned by European companies. And, um, and this is not a coincidence, and it's not just kind of a freak event. To me, this symbolizes the rise of European tech. And this is one of the things that motivated us to build TechEU way back in 2013, is that European tech is becoming more and more, I wouldn't say dominant, but at least on an equal footing with our friends and colleagues and competitors from the US and from Asia. It's not just music. Europe is being very, very strong and playing a very, very competitive game in a number of areas. Fintech, um, uh, gaming, especially mobile gaming, and I could go on and on in different sectors. Um, at TechU, uh, besides writing about startups and founders, we also do reports. So my friends in, the, in, our, in our team do reports on what's happening in Europe, especially particularly in funding. So if you go to the TechU site, you will find reports on European funding in, I don't know, Q1, Q2, Q3, and then all of 2016, 2017. So here we have just a few numbers put up on the board talking about how we're doing in Europe. So Q3 of 2017 was the best quarter on record ever for investments, for VCs, and for funding in Europe. Um, exits were very strong in 2016. We expect more of those and with more and bigger numbers uh, in 2017. And if you follow the tech publications, you will know that more and more funds are coming online. 
and, um, and bigger and bigger amounts are being raised. So when you look at Europe today, Sofia, Zagreb, Ljubljana, Tallinn, Paris, London, it's nothing like it was five, six, seven, or even 10 years ago. The opportunities for entrepreneurs, as our colleague from Google mentioned, and who's completely right, are way better than they used to be. Funding, co-working spaces, mentorship, education. So entrepreneurs today have opportunities like their friends and colleagues never had four or five years ago or 10 years ago. The downside is that it's easier than ever to get into a tech, to get into entrepreneurship, so the competition is bigger. But hey, if you're good and if you're a winner, you don't care about that too much. Who plays online games? I don't, but my son does. Okay, who knows this game, World of Tanks? Okay, who knows where this company is headquartered? Belarus, Minsk. So Minsk, the capital of Belarus. I've never been to Belarus. I don't have this huge desire to go. But if you ask more people, more, most people in the gaming community, they wouldn't know, ex except for the few people that are here that do know. Um, but it's an example of a European company dominating the world scene in their particular niche. So this guy, I'm sure everybody from Belgrade and Serbia recognizes the guy on the right-hand side. Um, so the company is called Nordius, and the game they're building is called Top 11. It's a world-dominating uh, game in uh, football management, online football management on your mobile phone. So these guys built this thing in Belgrade. So it's not London, it's not a high-tech hub, at least it's not recognized by the media as one. The, probably one of the most unlikely places to, uh, to, to build a super successful bootstrapped uh, digital company. And when you talk to Branko, who is the founder and CEO, he will tell you that they couldn't have built it anywhere else. Why? Because their HR strategy of himself and his co-founders is based on their network. So the original people that formed around the three co-founders, the key t team, are all of their friends from university and the people that they know and trust. And then around that team, they build a company that today has, I don't know, 150, 200 people in Belgrade, offices in London, and I guess Skopje as well. Um, so an amazing European success story, again, bootstrapped. So no external funding. And as Branko says, there probably isn't a VC in Europe that hasn't knocked on his door and sent him emails saying, you know, we'd like to invest in your company, but they were profitable from, uh, they were cash positive one month after the launch of the product. It's an outlier. Um, Supercell, Supercell up in Helsinki, where I'm going next week, um, is a company that does also mobile gaming. Uh, Supercell was uh, acquired first by uh, the Japanese, then the Japanese sold them to the Chinese, but still they're based in, uh, in, in Finland. Um, probably worth around, I guess, three or four billion euros as a company. They generate, last I checked, the company generates around $2 million of profit per day. So, um, so yes, we can build great companies in Europe. Uh, Prezi in Budapest, I'm sure many of you use those presentations where your head starts spinning, but nevertheless, a great tool for creatives. SoundCloud, two Swedes that went to Berlin to found their company. And we could go on and on. Outfit 7, Talking Tom, if you have small children, they're probably addicted. They sold it for a billion euros to the Chinese just a few months ago. Uh, again, bootstrapped, no external funding. The founders and their team put all of that money in their pockets, so they have a lot of money going around now. Uh, Photomath out of Croatia. And of course, Rimac Automobili. Again, super fast car, super car, electric, etc. So I could go on and on, but not too much. Take your time. So there are many, many, many of these companies, many of which are not well known. Some of, the, some of Europe's greatest tech successes are B2B companies. And if you're a B2B company, the general public doesn't know anything about you, and you don't need them to. But there are some amazing B2B companies in Europe. So the slide I opened with is actually a photo from, from a TransferWise marketing campaign. And the street that these nice, scantily clad ladies and gentlemen are in is actually Wall Street. So this is a marketing campaign uh, to, to um, launch TransferWise on the US market. Before that, they were just in uh, UK first and in Europe, et cetera. And the point of this, um, of this particular image is that they want transparency. They want to show how the banks have all these secret, um, the, they're kind of taking your money away and TransferWise wants to be transparent, so that's, that's why they have this politically incorrect marketing campaign. 
So uh, preparing for this talk, and I'll go through this very quickly because we don't have that much time, I reached out to some of my friends in the, uh, in the startup and tech community to ask them a simple question. What should our policy makers, what should uh, Mrs. Gabriel, who was here from the European Commission, what should her colleagues in Brussels and our national governments do to help our industry grow? And uh, Herti Tamo from Estonia, so this is a very typical answer for an Estonian, make ICOs legal, which is, I'm sure, a very, very worthy cause. Uh, Stefan Glenzer, one of the co-founders of Last.fm, uh, who is now a VC in London, uh, more visas for Tehis. So from Stefan's view, and I'm sure from many of our perspectives, the, people, the talent issue is critical. We need more people better educated. So all the efforts by Google and others to support that and to educate more tech people in our industry, digital leaders, is absolutely necessary. And we're going to have more and more need for those as the, as the years are going by. Sim Sikut, who is uh, one of the people behind the e-residency program in Estonia. Today, he's the chief information officer for the government. I just sent a single link, and if you get this presentation later, you can click on that link. It's a list of priorities uh, that was created by digital leaders in Europe, just recently published uh, during the Estonian uh, presidency of, uh, of the European Council, which is still ongoing. So he just sent a link to that list. This is a long slide, so I won't read the whole thing, but it's a very interesting guy. The guy is called Tom Wemeyer. He's actually a partner in Atomico. Atomico is one of Europe's largest VC funds. It's based in London. I was just visiting them about three weeks ago. Uh, their most recent fund raised early this year was 750 million euros. So there's 750 million euros targeted at European founders and high-tech entrepreneurs. And I won't read the whole thing, but I'll just start initially. I th so Tom says, I think the biggest shift in public policy is to move into offense mode and to start viewing regulation as an opportunity to derive competitive advantage at the country and regional level. So what he's saying here is that efforts to build connectivity, free Wi-Fi in parks and hospitals are okay, but actually this is a more ambitious proposal. This is a proposal where he expects our public policy leaders to take the initiative and to build regulation so that it really supports the strong growth and development of high tech. When I was visiting Estonia early July, I chatted with a government person about Uber. So just a few months before that, they had finally sorted out the regulatory issues around Uber. So Uber is now legal in Estonia. But at the same time, when they were figuring out how to make Uber legal, the same set of regulation um, regulated those little self-driving drones, if you see them. It's called Starship. So there's a company called Starship that has a little robot that has an antenna and it will deliver pizza to your door autonomously, kind of going along the sidewalk. So they included that in the regulation. It's just an example of very forward-looking uh, policy creation. My colleague Robin Waters, our editor, they're doing some things right, they're doing some things wrong, but they need to communicate better between public policy and with entrepreneurs as well. Uh, Kristen Talowalski, VC, Align Regional National Year Programs, hire former entrepreneurs and investors to run those programs because very often they're much smarter about it than public officials. Again, one of my friends from TechU, push promoting and training people. Again, this emphasis on training and AI machine learning. Max Kelly from Techstars London, who's actually in, in Sofia today for another event. Scaling companies need money, they need talent, they need customers. And finally, he says on a separate note, stop Brexit. So it's not something for us to do, but obviously a huge concern. So what about our region? What about Southeast Europe or the West Balkans, depending on how you politically prefer it? Well, in my experience, our politicians, our policy makers and leaders are not really always up to speed when it comes to digital. They, they tend to be preoccupied with more kind of down-to-earth things, so we need to push them. We need to lobby, and it's great that we have this event today with some of them present here in the conference. But on the other hand, all of us in high tech and our entrepreneurs and startups live in a kind of world of their own. So if you go to Web Summit, or if you go to Slush, or you go to any conference in Europe, entrepreneurs have the same problems, whether they're from Sofia, Ljubljana, or, or Lisbon, or Berlin, or London. They're kind of facing the same issues. How do I find my tech co-founder? How should I develop my programs? So they're living in this kind of similar world, and by and large, these companies can afford to be less dependent on local policy issues. 
So on the one hand, we who are a bit older need to push our policy leaders to make better policy, better decisions. On the other hand, we need to encourage our entrepreneurs not to be so dependent or even worry too much about local legislation and regulatory issues because they're all part of a global world and they're all addressing the global market. So quick plug, this is a book I wrote a few years ago with interviewing uh, many, many of European startups, some of whom were listed here during the presentation. You can look it up on Amazon, and some have said that it's a good read. Um, it's time for European startups to be awesome, to just go out and continue crushing and winning, and I think we have every kind of, um, every, all of the stuff we need to continue doing that. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I guess we have a panel now. Uh, my name is Ivo Spiegel. You can find me on Twitter and on TechU and, and here at the conference as well. Thank you.